The hermit kingdom of Korea may have opened its doors since the demise of the Japanese Empire, but in many ways it's more closed off than ever before. It's a place of unspeakable horrors, where smiling children perform pitch-perfect violin recitals for the elites, knowing full well that a single bum note could get their families thrown into a concentration camp. The country's cult of personality is so unlike anything the world has ever seen that it sounds like a work of fiction. It's a strange cross between 1984 and The Truman Show, where everyone performs, no one criticizes, and the rulers are always watching. After their leader gave it an order, Pyongyang previously launched a ballistic missile, which it called a major breakthrough in its banned weapons program. Who are the rulers? The Kim family, whose dead ancestors remain very much in power in what the late Christopher Hitchens called a necocracy. So how does a family keep the show running? How did they even rise to power? And will their grip on the nation last, or is their way of life coming to an end? ...of whom were promoted by Kim Jong-il just a year before he died. But the very nature of North Korea's dynasty and its chuche, or self-reliance policy, means that there will be no power sharing, just one supreme leader. It's time to learn how history works by entering North Korea, the biggest family-run dictatorship. Everybody just calm down. Kim Il-sung was actually born Kim Song-ju on 15th of April 1912. His family was Presbyterian and lived near the nation's capital of Pyongyang, but they soon relocated to Manchuria to escape Japanese rule, which had formally annexed the peninsula two years earlier. Zhu himself was taken by the anti-Japanese politics sweeping through his home country and joined underground movements to subvert imperial rule. When he was 14, Zhu had founded the Down with Imperialism Union, and would later drop out of military academy to focus on his communist interests. By the age of 17, he was the youngest member of a secret Marxist organization. But his disruptive activism got him thrown in jail for several months. He was so subversive that he was thrown out of the Comintern, an international group for world communism. Apparently, he was too nationalistic. By 1931, he had joined the Chinese Communist Party and was participating in guerrilla fights in northern provinces. The passionate revolutionary was undoubtedly a dedicated and formidable soldier, but it was his actions during a party purge that solidified his leadership. The Min Sheng Chan incident was a case of Chinese communists doing what communists do best, accuse each other of being traitors. This time the targets were mostly Korean. 500 members would wind up dead or tortured at the hands of the CCP. In fact, the purges killed more revolutionaries and supporters than the actual extermination campaigns waged by the Japanese. But this ended when Jews seized the documents pertaining the identities of suspected traitors and burned them. This act of defiance and compassion rallied support around Zhu. He was promoted within the rebel organization and changed his name to Kim Il-sung, meaning Kim become the sun. His leadership in raids won respect with the Chinese and became infamous amongst the Japanese. They hunted for him, forcing him to flee to the Soviet Union, where the Russians retrained him as one of their own riflemen. He served as a major in the Red Army against Japan in World War II, and was there when the Soviets invaded Monchuko. Once Japan had surrendered, and the Soviets were occupying Pyongyang, there came the question of who should rule Korea. They needed a loyal but capable puppet to help them maintain power in Asia. Sung had impressed the Soviets so much that Stalin personally recommended him for the position. This paved the way for Sung's return to his home country after more than 26 years away. Interestingly, he spoke very little Korean since he was raised in China, so he had to get his speeches translated before every public appearance. Initially, there had been plans for a free and democratic Korea, but that crumbled. Much like Germany, the country was split between the Allied powers, the US back to the south and the Soviets back to the north. By now, Kim Il-sung had been using his loyal brothers at arms to consolidate power and build a cult of personality. We're talking gigantic statues and choreographed parades. He established the Korean People's Army in 1948 and created many of the institutions that would become tools for control. The Federation of Literature and Art is where we get all the lovely, humble pictures of North Korean leaders as living gods. Three months after South Korea held its first ever democratic election, Sung officially proclaimed the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, which is a name as honest as fat-free Coca-Cola. In June 1950, and with the support of Stalin and Mao, Sung invaded his southern neighbours in an attempt to reunify the Korean Empire. Instead, the war ended with millions dead and a ceasefire. Technically, no peace treaty was ever signed, which is why North Korea still acts as if they are at war. 
Add to that a failed coup against Sung in 1956, and it seemed nothing was going to threaten his rule. Purges and public executions of dissidents were common. Camps were erected for political prisoners. There were even attempts to assassinate the South Korean president. Foreign nationals were kidnapped either to become agents for his regime or to help sustain the failing state. After all, Korea's relationships with other countries were souring, and the collapse of the USSR affected North Korea's infrastructure and economy. Strangely, a visit by Jimmy Carter actually persuaded Song to halt his uranium enrichment program. This seems to suggest that, at least in one point in time, Sung was more interested in a healthy relationship with the West than he was in acquiring nuclear weapons. Kick out Western nuclear inspectors. Uh, he's given me assurance that as long as this good faith effort is going on between the United States and, uh, and North Korea, that the inspectors will stay on site and the surveillance equipment will not be uh, interrupted. This gives us a chance to build up a confidence. The secrecy of the nation makes personal details hard to verify. It's rumoured that Sung fathered many children with women other than his wife, just in case you're wondering if he was an uncaring husband as well as an uncaring dictator. But he did have an heir. When he died suddenly from a heart attack on the 8th of July 1994, everything was in place for the 82-year-old's dystopia to continue. Kim Jong-il's succession into North Korea's next ruler meant this was the world's first communist dynasty. Kim Jong-il was born 16th February 1941 in a Siberian village, and he ruled from the day of his father's death until the day of his own. However, his official biography states he was actually born in 1942 in a secret military camp. Then again, the quote-unquote official word is that his birth was divine and signalled by the appearance of a glowing star and a double rainbow. It's also claimed on the state's official website, the Korean Friendship Association, that he doesn't defecate and scored 11 holes in one during his first ever round of golf. He's also credited with writing six full operas that are, quote, the best in the history of music and is the author of 1500 books. Obviously, these stories are not true. These are just a taste of the outlandish myths that would represent the new law of the land. Lest we forget, Kim Sung-il had died but was still presiding in heaven, looking over his son who was acting merely as a mortal conduit. But whereas the founder had cut his teeth in the trenches of revolutionary warfare, this new leader would use his inheritance to indulge his vices and extravagant lifestyle. While his people were starving, and sometimes turning to cannibalism, it was rumoured, Kim Jong-il was dining on fresh lobster that was airlifted in by helicopter. He once asked a chef to bring McDonald's back from Beijing so he could sample the forbidden fruit of the West. Afterwards, he came up with his own great idea to serve meat in a bun to his university students. Apparently, any resemblance to the Big Mac is purely coincidental. Yet, one of his favourite meals to eat was roast donkey. He wasn't the only one who ate well. His pet dogs got better meat than the average famine-struck Korean citizen, but they couldn't complain even if they wanted to. School children are taught that they need the love of the dear leader to grow, and households are banned from turning off the televisions that pump out state broadcasts 24-7. In fact, all visitors to Pyongyang must first lay flowers at the feet of the enormous statues of both Kim Jong-il and Kim Il-sung. Independent tourism is banned under Yong's souped-up cult of personality. All tour guides operate official sanctioned routes designed to deliver the most flattering image of the country. But look closely and you'll see cardboard skyscrapers, vacant and empty buildings, and restaurant waitresses perpetually laying and relaying tables for the imminent banquet that never comes. However, the real depravity of his rule can be found in his willingness to extend his hobbies and interests outside of North Korea's borders. Take his fondness of movies. Though it's unlikely Team America made it through the strict boundaries, he certainly had a vast collection of American movies that were forbidden to the Korean people. Apparently, his favourites were James Bond and Rambo. Presumably, he felt he could relate to the main characters. In the 1970s, he wanted to improve his own movie making. So, in a plot reminiscent of a spy thriller, he sent agents to kidnap South Korea's Marilyn Monroe, Choi on shi Compared to the people he had surrounded himself with, he actually respected the actress's opinions and ideas. Then, a few months later, he kidnapped a South Korean director to make his movies, Shin Sang-ok. In a twist of fate, the director was actually the ex-husband of the movie starlet. Under the implied threat against their lives, the two made movies for the dictator until they fell back in love and escaped. When it came to choosing his successor, the great leader apparently had it easy. His oldest son, 
Kim Jong-nam wanted to reform the government by transitioning power away from his family's rule. So that's him ineligible. Plus, he had tried to visit Tokyo Disneyland with a fake passport, which was pretty embarrassing. The middle son was apparently too shy and feminine, which makes the only viable candidate Kim Jong-un. He was born 8th of January 1982, but the official year is contested by intelligence agencies. A lot of information about him is shrouded in mystery. It seems that he lived in Switzerland, where he attended a private school under a false name. Some reports say this was actually his older brother, Kim Jong-chul, but is that a cover story when his identity was blown? He was reported to have moved to a state school where he showed skills in basketball, indifference to politics, and awkwardness around girls. He assumed the office of Supreme Commander of the Korean People's Army on the 30th of December 2011, the day after his father died from a heart attack. In stark contrast to the previous leader, Kim Jong-un's public image is less extravagant. Gone are the sunglasses and silver chopsticks. Instead, he's tried to cultivate a public image of an academic and sportsman with greater interest in the welfare of his people. He has been noted for interacting with the people of Korea more than his father did, but it's his close relationship with former NBA player Dennis Rodman that leaves many eyebrows raised. We laugh, we sing karaoke, we do a lot of cool things together. And we ride horses, we hang out, we go skiing. But behind the scenes, he's as violent as his predecessors. Kim Jong Nam had been exiled and living abroad since 2003. No doubt, he felt safe out of the clutches of the North Korean influence. But on the 13th of February 2017, while waiting for a flight in Kuala Lumpur International Airport, two women approached him and doused him with liquid and smothered him with a soaked rag. 20 minutes later, he was dead. Strange twist in the airport murder of the half brother of North Korean dictator Kim Jong Un. The liquid was the VX nerve agent, which had been banned by the Chemical Weapons Convention of 1993. The two women were apprehended. One was a Vietnamese national, and the other was Indonesian. Their story was that they had been hired by a prank TV show, so had no idea they were duped into committing an assassination. Is that believable? CCTV footage of their erratic behavior and quick escape suggested otherwise. More revelations are emerging about the killing of the North Korean leader's half-brother at Kuala Lumpur International Airport. The Malaysian daily New Straits Times reports that frame-by-frame -frame analysis of the CCTV footage of the February 13th attack on Kim Jong-nam shows the possible involvement of another two North Korean suspects. That said, they were seen in contact with four North Korean men who were initially released without charge, so maybe there is more to this than meets the eye. Yet, all evidence points to Kim Jong-un giving the orders to murder his family member. If that's true, and it probably is, then it raises concerns about what the Kim clan will do to hold onto power. Currently, the next successor is a toss-up between Kim Jong-un's own daughter and his older sister, Kim Yo-jong, who has made pretty public threats about using the Pacific as their firing range. Well, North Korea put its military might on full display last night during a massive parade that showed off Pyongyang's latest nuclear hardware. And for the second time this week, Kim Jong-un was spotted with his daughter and possible successor. Whereas some critics say his sister's notably more conservative public image is to make him look more reasonable, there are fears that a Hamlet-style coup within the family could lead to civil war. If Kim Yo-jong gets power before her niece is of age, will she give it up or will she do what every dictator does and purge any threats from within? Other possible successors include Kim Pyong-il, the last living son of the country's founder. There's also Kim Il-sung's nephews, which means there are a few candidates who could claim legitimacy to the throne. Time will tell whether the history of North Korea will be a short-lived one, or whether the peculiar iron-fisted rule will secure the Kim dynasty's influence for another generation. But with their focus on acquiring nuclear missiles so open, and their business with America and South Korea unfinished, let's hope we get the answers before it's too late. Dictator? and family man brought his daughter and wife to the military parade, which featured more intercontinental ballistic missiles than ever before designed to reach U.S. targets. So who do you think will become the next successor to North Korea? And how do you think the transition will go? Share your doomsday prediction in the comments. If you like this video, then be sure to check out our biography of Puyi, the last emperor of China, whose role in Manchukuo played a pivotal part in the rise of Kim Il-sung. 
If you'd like more videos about life under totalitarian rule, then leave a like and share this with someone who is a fan of crazy world leaders. Be sure to subscribe too, because we'll be back with a new video all about how history works.